So um, we'll get started, everyone. So thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. And I'd like to welcome you to the second session in our educational webinar series. Uh, my name is Rosalind Warner Arce, and I'm the Executive Director at Epilepsy Ontario. Over the coming months, we will be offering a series of webinars on various topics related to epilepsy. Tonight's session is um, called An Introduction to Epilepsy, presented by Suzanne Nurse, our Epilepsy Information Specialist at Ontario. So just before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, so your, as I mentioned, your phones have been muted so that we aren't distracted by background noises. So please do use the, the chat box um, to send any questions or comments through that you might have. And Suzanne will do her best to answer them during the presentation. And um, uh, if anyone's having trouble logging in, um, all you need to do is sign in as a guest. You don't need a login or ID or password or anything. So moving on, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Suzanne, uh, nurse. Suzanne has a PhD in medicine with a specialization in neuroscience. She has been actively involved in epilepsy education and support since 2008. Suzanne has supported individuals and families affected by epilepsy in her roles with community, provincial, and national epilepsy organizations. So I'm going to pass it over to Suzanne and let you take it away. Over to you, Suzanne. Okay, thank you. So um, can everybody hear me? Because we've uh, switched modes, and I just want to make sure that the sound is working. So maybe just type in the, the chat box. And, and can you hear me, Ron? I can hear you. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that the sound is coming through. Okay, okay. so good evening, everybody, and thank you, Rosalind. Uh, it's my pleasure to be um, with you tonight for the second uh, webinar in our Epilepsy Ontario webinar series and to be presenting tonight's topic of uh, introduction to epilepsy. And as Roz mentioned, if you have questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and, and, um, and enter them in the chat box and uh, we'll try to uh, address questions as we go along and there will also be an opportunity at the end of the session for people to ask questions as well. So the way that uh, tonight's session will work, I'm going to divide the webinar into three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be an introduction to seizures and epilepsy. Uh, and then in the second part, we're going to talk about some common seizure types, as well as the, the first date that um, people should be aware of for different types of seizures. And in the third part of the webinar, it's going to be your opportunity. So if you have questions that you would like answered or things that you've been wondering about, then you'll have an opportunity at that point at the end uh, if you had questions that haven't been addressed throughout the, the other parts of the webinar. So for the first part, uh, introduction to seizures and epilepsy, we're going to cover what are seizures, uh, what is epilepsy, what some of the causes of epilepsy are, and how epilepsy is diagnosed and treated. So hopefully after we finish this part, you'll have an understanding of um, epilepsy and seizures, um, understand that epilepsy is a brain condition, and um, that epilepsy is more common than most people realize. So seizures, uh, whenever we're talking about epilepsy, the, the word seizures is something that comes up quite a bit. And oftentimes people are a little unclear as to what the difference is between seizures and epilepsy, because the words are used a lot in, in discussions about, about epilepsy. So seizures are transient episodes uh, that are caused by a disturbance in brain activity. So there's been a sensitive change in brain function. And it can cause, uh, some, it can sometimes cause changes in attention. Uh, it could cause changes in behavior or perception. Seizures can also cause changes in uh, level of awareness um, and also loss of consciousness. So there can be a variety of different things that can happen during a seizure. And sometimes seizures are uh, considered to be provoked. And so when somebody talks about a seizure being provoked, what they mean is that if something has has cause that seizure, like, um, for example, a fever in very young children, they may be susceptible to having a seizure if they, if they have a, a, a fever when they're sick. Uh, somebody who has diabetes, for example, if they have an episode of low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, that could provoke a seizure. 
somebody who has been um, who has been drinking and is experiencing alcohol withdrawal during alcohol withdrawal that could provoke a seizure. So there can be a variety of different things, changes in the um, blood, um, in the sodium or potassium levels within the blood that can provoke a seizure, an infection, or a recent head trauma. So these sorts of seizures, these provoked seizures, are not epilepsy. Now some seizures are unprovoked. So when they occur, there isn't a fever at the time or no current infection. There's, um, if the person's blood is tested, there's no abnormalities in their blood sugar levels or what um, a healthcare professional might call your electrolytes, which would be your sodium and potassium levels in the blood. And there hasn't been a recent brain trauma within the past few days. So some people will experience a single unprovoked seizure and may never have another one. And so for most people, if they have a single unprovoked seizure, that usually is not epilepsy either. And experiencing a seizure is actually pretty common. So one out of every 10 people will experience a seizure at some point in their lifetime. So 10% of the population will experience a seizure. So that was what seizures are. Now what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a brain disorder, or it may be referred to as a neurological disorder. And it's a brain disorder in which a person is um, susceptible to having repeated seizures. So they have a greater likelihood that they could experience a seizure. And a diagnosis of epilepsy is made by a healthcare professional once a person has experienced two or more of those unprovoked seizures. Now, there's uh, been some recent changes in the definition of epilepsy. And uh, there's a new definition that's coming forward uh, in which some people may be diagnosed with epilepsy when they've experienced one unprovoked seizure, but in cases when there's other factors that increase that person's risk of having more seizures, more than um, what you'd expect for someone in perhaps the general population. So in addition to having a single unprovoked seizure, there may be other risk factors that increase that person's likelihood that they could have more seizures. At the present time, generally, uh, when we talk about epilepsy, it's usually somebody who's experienced two or more unprovoked seizures. So the um, prevalence of epilepsy, about one out of every 100 people have epilepsy. So it's a very common neurological disorder. So who could develop epilepsy? So Pretty much anyone, uh, an individual of any race, age, gender, socioeconomic status, religion, or geographic location. So anybody could develop epilepsy. And as I said, epilepsy can begin at any age. And this graph shows uh, the onset of epilepsy um, in people, and it can ha the onset of epilepsy can happen at any point uh, across the lifespan. Now, if you look at the blue line in this figure, it shows the onset of uh, generalized epilepsy. And there is a, a higher onset of generalized epilepsy in uh, young children, especially during the first year of life. So there's a, a higher rate of new onset epilepsy in that population. Uh, and if you look at the pink line, which is a, a different type of epilepsy called focal epilepsy, there's a higher rate of uh, focal epilepsy in seniors. So there are some age groups where there is um, a higher rate of new onset epilepsy, but epilepsy can begin at any age. So it can begin at somebody in their teens or in their early 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, so any point uh, across the lifespan. So even though epilepsy is uh, quite common, we often don't hear a lot about people who have epilepsy. So in many ways, it can be a hidden condition. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some people, some well-known people who have epilepsy. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Neil Young, and he's certainly been in the news in Canada a fair bit recently because of his uh, feelings about the tar sands in Alberta. Uh, so Neil Young is somebody who has epilepsy. 
Uh, Susan Boyle, if anyone followed any of the, um, the talent shows in the UK, she was one of the participants a few years ago, uh, and she had epilepsy um, when she was growing up as a young child. An actor in the United States, Danny Glover, has epilepsy. Uh, current the Chief Justice in the United States, so if you um, watched um, President Obama's um, uh, swearing-in ceremony, uh, John Roberts has epilepsy. A uh, very well-known uh, sprinter um, uh, who used to go by the name of Flojo, uh, she had epilepsy. And a young lady in Canada, uh, Cassidy Megan, who um, is the founder of Purple Day, and she's shown here in her beautiful purple dress and purple hat when she was meeting the queen, and uh, she has epilepsy. So what are some of the causes of epilepsy? So if you look at the bottom of this slide, one of the causes that's listed there is, is called idiopathic, and that's when the cause is unknown. And for the majority of people with epilepsy, um, the cause is unknown at this point in time. So many people will be diagnosed with epilepsy, but the actual cause of their epilepsy is not something that can be determined at this time. Uh, in other cases, there may be a cause that, that can be found or be associated with the, the person's epilepsy. Certainly we know that anything that can cause some sort of injury to the brain could be a potential cause of epilepsy. Um, this could be things like a stroke or neurodegenerative disease, and certainly these are very common causes um, in, in older uh, individuals. Uh, things like brain injury during birth or lack of oxygen during delivery, uh, head injury, fetal alcohol sy syndrome, different types of poisoning like lead poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning, and infections like meningitis. So there are a variety of different um, events or, uh, or diseases that can cause injury to the brain and then can be a potential cause of epilepsy. There can also be genetic mutations that can be a cause of epilepsy. Some of these can be inherited, and some of them can be new mutations in that individual that weren't um, in uh, either their, their parents. There can also be developmental abnormalities in the way that certain parts of the brain may form during development, and those can lead to epilepsy as well. But as I said, the most common cause is at this point idiopathic, where the cause is not known. So how is epilepsy diagnosed and treated? So for any of you who might be um, attending the webinar today, if you have epilepsy, you've probably gone through um, this sort of process of determining that you, um, that you have the diagnosis of epilepsy. So initially, somebody would go to their physician uh, if they've experienced episodes um, that they either feel might be a seizure or they don't know what they are, and they're kind of wondering what these episodes could be. And if a physician thinks that um, the episode that the person described um, could potentially be a seizure, they'll, they'll ask them to describe what had happened, uh, what they can recall from the episodes. And if anybody was uh, around at the time that could describe um, what they witnessed during these episodes, those witness descriptions can be very helpful as well uh, for the physician to hear as to what was going on when these episodes take place. So depending on the description of the episodes and, and, the, and whether the physician feels that they sound like they could potentially be seizures, they'll, they'll determine if they were seizures or some sort of other event that, that is not a seizure. If they do feel that the episodes are seizures, they'll look to see whether they were provoked. So the types of things that we talked about a little while ago, uh, whether they could be provoked by a fever or an infection or some other change like that, or whether the seizures were unprovoked. And so if the physician feels that perhaps uh, epilepsy could be a potential diagnosis, they might do some other diagnostic tests as well. An EEG or electroencephalogram, and the picture on the slide of the, of the young woman having an EEG, this is when they're going to get a measure of brain function. So uh, EEG is going to record the brain waves, and it will give an indication of brain function. And sometimes an EEG can also be quite helpful in uh, showing that somebody could have a susceptibility to having seizures. 
Another diagnostic test that may be used might be brain imaging, where they'll get a picture of the brain, uh, for example, using an MRI, and that will show the structure of the brain. And so based on all of this information together, the description of the episodes from the individual themselves and the witness, uh, testing to determine whether they might have been provoked or unprovoked, and other diagnostic tests like the EEG, all of these pieces of information together will be used by the physician to determine whether the episodes are seizures and whether the individual has epilepsy. And if a diagnosis of epilepsy is made, the most common treatment for epilepsy is anti-seizure medication. Now, uh, there's going to be a future webinar next month about treatments for epilepsy. So I'm not going to go into that in, um, in great detail in tonight's webinar because you'll be able to, um, to get a lot of detail about treatments for epilepsy in next month's webinar. But if anti-seizure medication does not stop seizures, there are other treatment options available, and these include things like brain surgery. There are also special um, treatments for epilepsy that are dietary, and it's one called the ketogenic diet, and there are other options like brain or nerve stimulators. So if medication is not effective in preventing seizures, or in some cases if it causes intolerable side effects, then a person should be referred to a neurologist who specializes in epilepsy uh, to explore what other treatment options would be available to them. So for most people who live with epilepsy, there's certainly a challenge of living to cope with the unpredictable nature of seizures. And in addition to the seizures, there can be other factors as well associated with epilepsy that can be a challenge of living with epilepsy and something that um, epilepsy is more than just the seizures themselves. So epilepsy can have an impact on a person's independence. Um, certainly if a person's seizures are uncontrolled, that can have an effect on uh, things like being able to drive. Um, epilepsy can be associated with a greater prevalence of certain mood disorders, so things like depression and anxiety disorders. And for some people, there can be significant side effects of medications that can make it quite challenging. And so the ultimate goal of treatment for epilepsy is to get uh, no seizures and with the fewest uh, amount of side effects possible. So for the second part of the, the webinar this evening, what we're going to look at is some uh, different types of seizures, as well as some of the basics of seizure first aid. And throughout, the, um, throughout this part of the presentation, if you have any questions about seizure types or anything that um, you have questions about related to the first part of tonight's webinar, feel free to enter any questions into the chat box, and uh, we'll uh, certainly try to address any of the questions you may have. So for this part of the webinar, um, the, uh, what we'd like you to, to take away from what we're going to be covering is uh, to learn that there is more than one type of seizure. Um, sometimes when people are unfamiliar with epilepsy, um, many people will uh, be not too familiar with the fact that there can be more than one type of seizure. We're going to talk about some of the common seizure types, um, as well as what somebody should do when a seizure happens. And also for, um, for people, it can be very helpful to know when a seizure would be a medical emergency. So the basics of seizure first aid. For any type of seizure, there are really three key things to keep in mind related to um, responding to somebody having a seizure episode. And uh, first of all, this would be to stay calm. And that can be very difficult in, in, um, in many circumstances. When you have a loved one or a friend or a family member experiencing a seizure, that can be quite traumatic, especially if um, they've never had a seizure before. But even if they've had seizures before, witnessing somebody you love or somebody you know, or even witnessing a stranger having a seizure can be quite an emotional event. The thing uh, that can help in many cases is that certainly we know that most seizures typically will run their course and end naturally on their own. 
and normally seizures will only last a few seconds to a few minutes in length. As certainly it's important to time the seizure to have an indication as to how long it's been, it's been lasting. And uh, most importantly, we certainly want to keep the individual who's having a seizure safe, so to protect them from harm. So for seizure types, normally seizure types are divided into two categories. And this depends on what's happening with the seizure activity in the brain when the seizure begins. So the category on the left-hand side is called focal seizures. And focal seizures are ones where the seizure begins within one hemisphere of the brain. So this could be the left hemisphere or it could be somewhere in the right hemisphere. But the onset of the seizure at the very beginning is somewhere within one hemisphere. The other category on the right-hand side, generalized seizures. Generalized seizures are when there's widespread seizure activity in both hemispheres of the brain. So that's the, the way that these two categories of seizures are differentiated. So if we discuss focal seizures first, and then we'll look at generalized seizures afterwards. So focal seizures are also sometimes called partial seizures because they're beginning in a part of the brain. And so as I said, there's a focus or a site somewhere within one hemisphere where the seizure originates. And for a focal seizure, the manifestation of the seizure or what happens, what you might notice or what the individual would experience, is going to depend on the region of the brain where the seizure begins. So the region of the brain is involved in the seizure activity. So for example, at the back of our brain, there's a, a region called the occipital lobe. If a seizure begins in somebody's occipital lobe, that part of the brain plays a role in vision. And so because that, that region is involved in, in processing information and playing a role in, in vision, if there's a seizure occurring there, there can be a disturbance in somebody's vision or their or their visual perception. So for example, they may see colored circles uh, during a seizure episode if the seizure is occurring in that part of their brain. In the frontal part of our brain, there's a region that's involved in controlling movements of the body. And if somebody's seizure was to originate there, there could be some uncontrollable movements of one region of their body, so perhaps you know a, a finger or their foot or their leg. So there could be one region of the body where there's some uncontrollable movements because that's where the seizure is originating in the part of the brain that controls that particular function. So for different people who have focal seizures, they could have very different types of seizures depending on what part of the brain is involved. Now, for some types of focal seizures, when they occur, the person is going to retain their full awareness. They would be completely aware that they were having a seizure. They'd be able to tell somebody standing next to them or somebody they were talking to that they were having a seizure at that particular point in time. And uh, they don't have any sorts of um, changes in their ability to uh, communicate or their level of awareness. So in this case, there would be no need for any sort of first aid when the person has uh, retained awareness uh, throughout their focal seizure. Now in this image, we can see um, an image of the brain and superimposed on that is an indication of areas in the brain where there's different levels of activity. And if you look on the image on the right-hand side, over the temporal lobe, there's an area that's indicated in red. And this is showing an, a region of the brain where there's a seizure occurring over the left temporal lobe. Now, somebody who is experiencing this particular type of seizure, it would be a focal seizure because it's occurring uh, within one region of the hemisphere. So one part of the, of the brain here in the, in the left temporal lobe. And often with these sorts of temporal lobe seizures, they often lead to a change in the person's level of awareness. 
So unlike the earlier types that we just discussed where there was full awareness, with these temporal lobe seizures, often there can be a change in the person's level of awareness. And these sorts of seizures have gone by a number of different names over the years. Uh, many people might be familiar with temporal lobe seizures being called complex partial seizures. And there's been some new terminology put forward uh, recently. So now these sorts of seizures are often being called focal discognitive seizures, which is certainly a mouthful. Uh, but what that term is implying is that there's a change in the person's cognition uh, during the seizure. So they, there may be some confusion. There could be a change in their level of awareness. Uh, there could be some change in their ability to communicate. So there's some sort of impairment in function during the seizure. And for these types of seizures, uh, in order to support and help somebody who's having this type of focal seizure, you're going to want to, um, again, stay calm, time the seizure so you know how long it's lasting, and protect the person from harm. So if there's a change in the person's level of awareness, somebody who's there to assist them is going to help to be perhaps their eyes and their ears. So look around in the environment where the person may be and see if there are any sorts of hazards or anything that could lead to somebody being injured. So you'll look in the environment depending on where you are. If you're in a kitchen and somebody's boiling spaghetti at the stove, that pot of boiling water on the stove is a potential hazard. So you'd want to gently guide the person away from something that could be a danger. If you're in a, in a living room and there's no particular hazardous objects or there isn't a flight of stairs, that particular room might not be a hazard in any way, so there might not be anything you'd need to do to keep the person safe. You certainly want to remain with the person after this particular type of seizure ends until full awareness returns. Okay, so we've talked about some types of focal seizures. The other category of seizures are known as generalized seizures. So these are ones where there's widespread seizure activity in both hemispheres. And as you can see, underneath generalized seizures, there are a number of different kinds. So in generalized seizures, there's widespread seizure activity in both hemispheres of the brain. And many generalized seizures cause changes in the muscles, and that's how most of these seizures get their name. So, for example, a tonic seizure is going to be associated with an increase in muscle tone or a stiffening of the muscle. An atonic seizure is associated with a loss of muscle tone, so all of a sudden the person loses muscle tone. Uh, a tonic-clonic seizure, so these have um, often uh, very similarly sounding names, but with the tonic-clonic seizure at the beginning, there's initially an increase in muscle tone or a stiffening, followed by a clonic phase where there's a rhythmic jerking motion of the muscles. And many people are familiar with that particular type of seizure. It's one that used to be called a grand mal seizure. And tonic-clonic is the, the newer, terminology, newer, newer terminology that's used. Myoclonic is another type of generalized seizure. And these are ones where there are sudden muscle jerks. Um, that can happen simultaneously. For example, maybe um, uh, both arms or both shoulders may suddenly have a jerk. So one type of generalized seizures um, are known as absence seizures, and uh, these used to be called the T-mal seizures. Now these particular uh, generalized seizures, um, both hemispheres of the brain are involved in generating seizure activity because it's a type of generalized seizure. These are very brief uh, seizures. They can last from maybe 2 to 20 seconds. And uh, what it would look like, the person may have a blank or a vacant stare. Sometimes they can be uh, confused with um, daydreaming episodes because it might look like the person has drifted off and is daydreaming. They can start and they can end quite abruptly. Sometimes there can be movements of the eyes. The person may blink or their eye may roll upwards. 
Uh, there sometimes might be some movements of their jaw or there might be some chewing movements during these types of seizures. But during that brief period of time, those few seconds when the seizure is happening, there is a complete loss of awareness. And here's an image of what um, the activity in the brain would look like uh, during a generalized seizure in this particular type of absence seizure. In the middle part of the screen, you can see what an EEG, the electroencephalogram, would look like during an absence seizure. And these other colored images that are around on the outside show the level of brain activity during an absence seizure. Now, if you look at uh, image D over in the top right-hand uh, part of the screen. The areas that are uh, red and white are showing very, very high levels of activity, um, the reddish and yellow areas as well. And you can see that there's a very high level of activity on both sides, both the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. So an absence seizure, because they're so brief and uh, there's usually very little that is needed to be done, uh, and so usually no first aid is required. The main thing with absence seizures is to um, it's important to notice that they are happening, uh, to bring them to the attention of a physician so that the, the person who's experiencing these seizures can receive the proper treatment. Um, and as certainly, if they are receiving treatment, it's good to notice whether the, how the treatment is affecting the frequency of these seizures, because the goal of treatment would be to reduce the number of these episodes so that the, the, um, the person is no longer experiencing these seizures. So another type of seizure that I mentioned when I went through some of the different names of generalized seizures is one called a tonic-clonic seizure, or used to be called grand mal. Again, because it's a generalized seizure, both the left and the right hemisphere are involved in generating seizure activity. And these seizures are longer. So an absence seizure is very brief, maybe 2 to 20 seconds in length. A tonic-clonic or grand mal seizure is um, several seconds could be about a minute in length to maybe two or three minutes in length would be a typical duration for this particular type of seizure. And during a tonic-clonic seizure, the person would be unconscious throughout the seizure. Often at the beginning of the seizure, if the person was standing, they would fall because there's that sudden increase in muscle tone at the beginning of the seizure. And then the second phase, the clonic phase of the seizure, would be a rhythmic jerking motion of the muscles in the body. So for first aid for a tonic-clonic or a grand mal seizure, uh, again, the three points that I, uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier, stay calm, time the seizure, and protect from harm. In order to keep somebody safe during a tonic-clonic seizure, what you'd want to do is to put something soft under the person's head, especially if they're in an area where there's a hard surface, so um, you know a hard floor or concrete um, surface. Uh, so you'd want something to protect their head so that during the convulsive movements of the seizure, they've got something cushioning uh, their head. Also, when you're able to, it's helpful to turn the person onto their side. And the reason for this is that many people towards the end of a convulsive seizure or a tonic-clonic seizure may feel nauseous, and some people do get sick. So it can be helpful to be turned to the side instead of the person lying on their back, especially at the, near the end of a seizure. The other reason why it's a, uh, helpful to turn somebody onto their side is there's um, a lot of muscle movement uh, in all the muscles in the body, including the muscles in the face and the jaw area. And a lot of that muscle movement around in the mouth region can stimulate saliva production. So if you turn the person onto their side, then any extra saliva that's produced during the seizure can easily drain out of the mouth, so it's safer than the person lying on their back. And again, just as uh, for focal seizures where there's a change in the person's level of awareness, with a tonic-clonic seizure, you'd also want to remain with the person afterwards until full awareness returns. So emergency situations. Uh, for somebody who's diagnosed with epilepsy, 
a seizure is part of their diagnosed neurological disorder. So generally, if the person has a diagnosis of epilepsy, a seizure is not usually a medical emergency. Although it's always good if you or a family member receive a diagnosis of epilepsy to ask your physician when would, a di when would a seizure be a medical emergency for you? Because it's always good to have that information for your personal situation. So in general, you would call 911 for somebody who's having a seizure if the person does not have epilepsy. If the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, and so you can remember this by, um, by looking at your fingers on one hand. And if you get to a seizure that's lasted longer than five minutes, then that's more than a handful, and that's time to call 911. If a second seizure occurs before the person has fully recovered from the first seizure, so repetitive seizures without full recovery would be a sign that somebody should receive immediate medical care. If regular breathing doesn't return when the seizure ends. So for example, if somebody's having a tonic-clonic seizure, breathing is often shallow during that particular type of seizure, but you would expect regular breathing to return when the seizure comes to an end. So if regular breathing does not return when the seizure ends, that would be another time to call 911. If the individual has diabetes, so somebody who has diabetes and experiences a seizure, they require emergency medical attention because you need to uh, evaluate whether they're having um, an episode of hypoglycemia or not. If a seizure occurs in water, that also requires emergency medical attention. And if the individual is pregnant, Now, for uh, the last part of the webinar this evening, if you have questions that you would um, like answered or you're wondering about, or if things have come to mind while we've been going through the other parts of the presentation, um, feel free to enter any kinds of questions that you might have into the chat box that's on the right-hand um, bottom part of your screen. Um, Suzanne, it doesn't look like that we have any questions, so maybe um, mm -hmm. you want to move on? Yes. So one thing I'd like to remind everybody about, many of you may know that March um, is Epilepsy Awareness Month, and next Wednesday on March 26th is Purple Day for Epilepsy. And on Purple Day, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to spread um, awareness about epilepsy, uh, to and educate people that you know, um, members of the general public, and, uh, and to um, increase awareness about epilepsy. So if you have any interest in learning about ways that you can become an epilepsy ambassador, um, be sure to get in touch with either us at Epilepsy Ontario or your local epilepsy agency, because there's many ways that people can become involved in raising awareness about epilepsy, and March 26th is certainly a wonderful opportunity to do that. Epilepsy Ontario is, um, has started a, a, a webinar series, and our next webinar will be April 24th, when um, the topic will be Understanding Treatments for Epilepsy. And if you'd like to be able to um, receive information and notice about uh, webinars as well as other upcoming events, uh, and also to get information about um, various things that are happening related to epilepsy, uh, you should subscribe to Voices of Epilepsy, which is a weekly e-newsletter um, published by Epilepsy Ontario. And you can subscribe to Voices of Epilepsy on our homepage, so epilepsyontario.org. If you have additional questions or would, um, are looking for information or support, a uh, very good source of information and support related to epilepsy would be your local epilepsy association. And in Ontario, you can visit our website for information about local agencies. 
you can also call 1-800-463-1119, toll free in Ontario, to get information about local agencies near you. So thank you all for participating in tonight's webinar series. I hope that uh, you come back to next month's uh, webinar, the one related to understanding treatments for epilepsy. And if you have any questions after tonight's, uh, after tonight's webinar, be uh, sure to get in touch with us. And I believe that, uh, Rosalind, you have a few words to add as we, as we conclude. I do. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So, um, uh, Suzanne, first of all, I just would like to say thank you very much for spending uh, time with us this, e this evening and for sharing this valuable information, particularly, I mean, all of it was really helpful, but uh, really interesting learning about different seizure types, so thanks very much for doing that. It, you know, information is empowering, and through tonight's webinar, we hope that our participants have found this session to be helpful. Uh, as Suzanne mentioned, please do visit our website to find the local epilepsy agency near you. And you can uh, go to our homepage, click on the education button, and then on contact us. So we will be sending out an evaluation form for this webinar tomorrow. We do ask that you uh, complete it. Your feedback is very helpful for us in developing our, our webinar program. And um, I want to thank everyone very much for joining us. Have a good evening, everyone.